Good evening. I'm Rafael Martinez and it's waiting in darkness. This is a grand Friday. A huge Friday that we're recording this on. A Friday that some will say could live in infamy. Maybe it might, maybe it won't. I don't think it will. I'm a huge fan of what's happening today. Gran Turismo 7 came out today. Got it. Been playing it. It's fire. That's all you need to know by the game. The Batman is out today. We'll be seeing it. We'll be talking some Batman stuff later on today. Tonight on this show. I won't give my review because by the time this airs, I will not have seen the movie yet. Well, what time I'm recording this, I will not have seen it. By the time it airs, I will have seen it. Maybe next week I give a review. Maybe I don't. Maybe you have to wonder what I thought about the movie. Maybe. If you follow my socials, you'll know how I feel about it. Hey, it's that Ralph on Instagram. Ralphie Martz on Twitter. And those are the only two I'm going to give it out. Those are personal ones. But who knows? Maybe on this Sweat and Darkness, I'll talk about it too. I'm not above that. I know you people crave my ideas and thoughts, and I will give them when I feel comfortable. But... Today's a good day. The mayor has announced. And yes, I'm saying it softly. Because it's a beautiful, beautiful thing he did. The key to the city mandates and the mask mandates at school are now over. That's right. COVID's over. We're done now. No more COVID. I kind of knew that would happen with World War III arriving. And with last week's episode being hacked by the Russians and technical difficulties, file corruption, it happens. We might have been able to save some of it. Maybe we'll tack this on to the end of this show. I don't know. But now that World War III is here, COVID's done. And the beautiful part about all this is it's time to go back outside. And I know some people, they don't want to go back outside. Some people over the last three years found a new identity for themselves in the pandemic. Because think about it before. Before, they were losers. They were people with no agendas, no meaning, nothing to live for. Then the pandemic happened and they all became medical experts. Then they became civil rights experts. And then they became policy experts. Everyone got to live out a kayfabe fantasy. They all got to cosplay a little bit. Some people cosplayed as civil rights activists. Some people cosplayed as democratic movers and shakers. Others as doctors or nurses. It was a great time. It was a fantastic time for grift. And you know me. I love a good grift. But all grifts must come to an end. All shams must be revealed. And it's time for everyone to go back to what you used to do. And that's not be important. It's time to go back to the office. It's time to go back to normal everyday life. And I know it's frightening because a lot of you have been popping some hot shit off on the internet thinking you wouldn't see anybody outside again. (laughs) And you were wrong. All the people you talk shit about, all the people you've refused to see ever again, are outside, and they've been outside the entire time. They've been waiting for ya. I'm never gonna talk to this person ever again. How could they hold these political beliefs? Guess what, Carol? They're on the train with you now. I can't believe... This person believes in blue lives matter when we should be focusing on black lives right now. Hate to break it to you, Derek. Kyle's on the train with you now. You're eating at the same restaurants again. You're hanging out in the same places. How many of you did you think? How did you think you're going to keep all this up? All this division? Because now you have to live in a society with each other again. Can't tweet about it. 
and Instagram about it. It's time to go back outside. And the thing about it is, like, we didn't grow up outside. Like, I grew up outside. I was always skateboarding out with my friends. I was always hanging out. So you knew the cost of saying some shit. Because you knew outside, anyone could get got. And you're probably saying to yourself now, but Ralph, I don't want to go back outside. Have you seen New York? Everyone's getting got. And I'm like, well, you know what? It's the hustle economy. If you're not being stabbed by a hobo while on your way to your dream, are you truly going after your dream? I think not. That's the whole idea of the New York dream. If Sex and the City was made now, well, not the reboot, I mean, like, if they were to take that show now, there definitely would have been an episode where one of them got stabbed by a hobo, or at least an attempt of stabbing. That's real New York. I, I saw a hobo light his clothes on fire on the L train one day. It was kind of cool. It was a ballsy move. Considering he might need that clothes later. But then again, the warm weather's coming. Maybe he doesn't need it. Maybe he's got a whole new spring wardrobe he's working on. So he's going to burn that, go to the Salvation Army, and find some new digs. Who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? Just a dude. But in celebration of all this, I'm going to have some liquid death water. Still not a sponsor, but so help me God, they will be. It's a great time. We're all back outside. Some of you now have to go back to work. Now, I'm not saying the people who were working from home, I was working from home. I will probably be forced to go back to the office eventually. And it would make the recording schedule of this show a little difficult. But I'll go back. But then there was the anti-work people. The people who didn't want to go back. You're going to have to go back now. If the, if the ending of the unemployment checks didn't tell you that, this is now. Everything's open. It's yours for the taking, I guess. But I really think some people didn't think we were going to get out of this and built new identities based on that survival condition. It wasn't ever going to last. Don't get me wrong. I definitely hypothesized a few times. Of the pod people scenario. Where we all live in a pod society. Where we all don't leave our houses. And Amazon deliver, delivers everything to us. And we're just. You know. Homebodies. But I was wrong. And that's great. We haven't seen Fauci in a while. Interesting. Wonder where they put him. What if he has any more. Mask lies to tell us. Wonder when his book will come out. I mean, he's not that important anymore. Once you get the Disney documentary, it's over. You've met, that's your, that's the end of the run. You got the doc. You're now immortalized. You're done. Now we put him away until the next pandemic happens. But to be honest, who cares if another one happens? Who cares? Listen, but what do we learn from all this? Some people are going to do what they have to do, and some aren't. Some are determined to live, quote-unquote, free, no matter what anyone tells them. Even if science and the Grim Reaper himself tells them otherwise. Can't argue with that. They're, they're locked in. But hey... Go, I say go back out there and live free in a way. Not too free. We still have laws and an economy. But go be that slut you've always wanted to be. I don't care what your gender is. Man, woman, them, they, who, what, where. I don't care. Whatever you are, go out there and slut it up. Get in contact with people. Rub ugly stuff. You haven't been touched in years, so you might as well. Some of you are really depressed. Get outside. The sun is out now. Soon spring will be here. And so will Passover, which I'll have a bunch of days off of because of my job. Spring break. Fun times. 
what else is there to do? How much longer did you want to keep these masks on? Spoiler alert, they kind of weren't working. As we found out now, conveniently, what did work was the vaccines, for the most part. Not 100%, but it did enough. I am under the weather a little bit. Excuse me, that's a burp from liquid death water. And the water is so pure that the burp itself was so pure. I actually feel healthier for burping. Goddamn, liquid death is so good. But yeah, I'm under the weather. Got a little sniffy sniffs, but I'm going outside because my mayor told me to. My mayor also told me that he packs heat. And I like that about this mayor. He carries a gun because you kind of have to now. And how great is it that he announces this on Friday when Batman comes out? Because truly, New York is now Gotham City. And we are in need of a Batman. Though I don't think we have a millionaire who's good enough to do it. People always ask, how come millionaires don't become superheroes? And it's like, why would you, really? Iron Man can only be Iron Man because he knows he's going to live. He's in a movie. He's going to be fine. Yeah, he, he dies at the end of like Endgame, but that's like after 10 years of movies, though. So he's had a great run. But who would be a superhero if you knew that what the odds are you're going to die? No one. So I respect the fact that they don't become superheroes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I don't think society is worth saving, to be honest with you. Not that I hate America. I don't. I'm actually pro-American. Which for a Puerto Rican could sound pretty weird, but I am. I still believe in the stars and stripes when it works out. Granted, I do believe America is a gangster's paradise. And it's for criminals by criminals. Which is, you know, not necessarily a positive. But I dig it. It's better than faking it. But now you can't fake it. Now you gotta go outside. You gotta go outside and deal with people you don't like now. And I was already to hate. I was already hating it. Going on the train to work sometimes. When more people started coming out. Because I liked when no one was outside. It was free. I could walk anywhere. And not have to hear people. But... As the old saying goes, fuck it, man. But it's time now. It's time to go back outside. It's time for some messy hookups to occur again. It's time for you to engage in drunken conversations with people you probably will never see again. But hey, he's got some interesting theories. Sure, he's a flat earther, but he is cute. And he can sing, so why not? Why not, Wally? Already, the ecosystem's kind of balanced out. Men and women are at each other's throats again on social networks. So they're back to normal. Recently, a woman put, if you play video games, that's a red flag. And everyone proceeded to make fun of her for that because it's like, oh, so a, a video game dude broke your heart. That's unfortunate. Because some of us who enjoy Super Mario, like myself, we're not heartbreakers. That's not what we do. But I deduce that anything that men enjoy is a problem for women. And not all of them. Most of them. If we breathe, it's toxic, mas- it's toxic masculinity. If we play video games or enjoy playing 2K with our friends every now and then, that's a problem. It's a sign of immaturity. But if you re- look at it, how many men have taken their video game 
playing and turn it into a career and make money off of it. So we couldn't even take something that we enjoy and enjoy it. We had to turn it into a career so people would get off our ass about it. Comic books. Had to become a comic book collector. Had to open a store. Oh, you play Magic the Gathering? I got to get the most expensive cards so I can sell them off. And people can think, oh, what a smart investment he made. Men really can't enjoy shit, to be honest with you. And some would say it's a comeuppance for years of patriarchy. But hey, you know, it's not our fault. It really isn't. It's nature's fault. Evolution just worked the way it did. Which is why I'm excited for the next 20 years for women. Because if you look at all these women MMA fighters and pro wrestlers coming up, they're super strong. And they're actually changing the very evolution of what women can accomplish. So maybe, just maybe, we get a more balanced society. But that doesn't mean we can't enjoy video games. If anything, you should be happy your boyfriend plays video games. It means it's in the house and not fucking somebody else. It's a trade-off. Or how about you play video games with him? Play Mario Party. I've never met anyone who didn't enjoy Mario Party. You have to be a soulless cunt to not enjoy Mario Party. You have to be. And if video games are a sign of immaturity, then what the fuck is watching reality shows a sign of? If you can sit there and watch 12 hours of Bad Girls Club, then I should be able to sit there and play 12 hours of Grand Theft Auto. They're the same exact thing. The only difference with our thing is we know it's a work. We know it's fake. But women in the reality shows get caught up in the editing and they feel things that are artificial in nature because the story they're telling is artificial. It's not real. No reality show is real, except 90 Day Fiance. That shit is brutally real. That shit's almost too fucking real. I don't even know how to get away with half of the shit that happens on that show. But yeah. We can't enjoy shit. Can't enjoy a goddamn thing. Can't enjoy pro wrestling. You know it's fake, right? No shit. So are movies. So are TV shows. So are some of the stories told in songs. So are novels. It's all fake. It's all fake business, baby. That's what it is. Men, we're just more open about the things that we like being fake. Then we get shit for liking sports. Oh, you spend too much time watching sports. One woman put a post up saying, how is it you guys can watch a, a game Watch the post-show of the game. Then the next day, watch a show of two guys analyzing the game you watched the night before. You watch the post-show of. Because it's science. And it's math. And we are appreciating human ability. Physical ability. Shit we can't do. Shit you can't do, toots. Literally, it's it's fucking magic. It's human fucking magic. So, of course, we're going to watch a post game about it because there's some stuff that we don't even understand. Yeah, we understand the basis of basketball. You put the fucking um, ball through the hoop, two points, three points, there's fouls and all that. But when it comes to the actual strategy of the game, which is heavily mental, which is mental chess, that has to be explained to us sometimes. Because there are some movements that are just fucking beautiful. Football, for instance. Everyone gets caught up on a CTE issue, which is a valid issue. But it's not a dumb man's game. Those men are highly intelligent. The way they're able to memorize playbooks, read screens, read plays as they're happening. Just the level of reflex mentally. I would argue it's CIA agent level. Has to be. James Bond can do some of that shit. But that's why we enjoy it. Because there are guys who are doing more than we could ever do. And our fandom of it is cultural it's tribal we fucks with our city we fucks with our players their win is our win you know it's why you see a lot of players they get emotional when they leave teams because they know it is to have that love there's something about men when we show each other love whether it's through cheering for each other whether it's through having each other's back whether it's like you know just the things we talk about 
we have a very deep emotional connection to things. We just don't fucking do lifetime movies about it. We're just not Dr. Phil about it. It's a very honest misconception of what men are. Um, we're sorry we don't uh, express ourselves the way you women do. We don't. You know, men, male friendships have always had a deep undertone of emotion. It's just never spoken because for us, it's not about what it's said. It's about what's done. It's why if you look at male friendships, they're always judged by what one man does for another. Not necessarily what he says to somebody. Not necessarily, you know, gossip. It's what has he done to me? What have I done to him? That's what we judge a relationship on. Actions have always meant more than words. And we're just action people. There are dudes to this day that I don't talk to for months on end. But when I speak to them, there's emotion going on there. There's real shit going on there. And sometimes nothing really has to be said. A look can be exchanged. and Something can be mentioned and it's like, yeah, I hear you. I'm right there, which I'm experiencing the same thing. Men in our male friendships just always seem to get cut down to you guys don't want to talk about your feelings. You guys don't want to go to therapy. All right, cool. A lot of us do. And you know what? We still get shit on for it. We talk about how we want men to express themselves however they want to express themselves, but Lakeith um, Stanfield was just on the cover of a magazine dressing the way he wants to dress. We'll put a picture up of it on the screen. He had his heels on. He had his whole little feminine thing going on. But yeah, women trashed him for it. They were making fun of him for it. Okay, so you want us to express ourselves, but now we get made fun of for it. Judd Apatow did movies on this for years. And then what happened? Oh, we're so tired of the bromance movies. But you also want us to talk about our feelings. Fucking pick one. You have to pick one. It can't just be we express ourselves the way you want us to all the time. Can't be. Sorry. People make fun of how men get caught in these Marvel movies and how, like, people cried when Iron Man died. For dudes, that was an important thing. They followed that character for 10 fucking years. I didn't cry. kind of knew it was coming. I got more emotional when Spider-Man disappeared in Infinity War. That's more because of his age and reminded me of my brother. So, you know, it was like, Dan, that'd be like if my brother was disappearing because of Thanos. But you see what I mean here? It's like... We do get caught up in highly emotional things. And I feel like until we're allowed to express ourselves emotionally, the way we feel is correct and comfortable for us instead of trying to maintain some standard someone else is throwing on us, we're never going to get to this quote-unquote equality that people want us to have. You know, It's it's always equality until we do something you don't want us to do. Or we don't do it the way you want us to do it. And that's a problem. I don't have that in my relationship. Not at all. Like, my girlfriend knows I'm with my boys. We talk about certain things. And I'm able to express myself emotionally in a way I feel comfortable. Which I am very expressive to begin with. Hence, I have a show. But I never feel like she wants me to express my feelings the way she wants me to express them. She's always waiting to receive whatever I'm willing to give. And in a lot of ways, I think that's, if you really truly want men to get comfortable, you have to give us the space to define what it is for us to be emotional creatures. How do we even give that to one another? There's a moment in wrestling, Ric Flair's having his, I guess his first retirement match against um, Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania. And the entire time, Shawn Michaels is telling him, I don't want to be the guy that retires you, but I'm known as Mr. WrestleMania, and I refuse to tarnish my legacy. But I don't want to have to beat you, Rick. And Rick's this old man. He's begging him to beat him. You know, he's just determined to lose. If he's going to lose, it's going to be to Shawn. And if someone's going to end his career, it's got to be Shawn. And it's hurtful for Shawn because he loves this man. He idolizes this man. He's known this man for a good part of his life. And he knows he's one of the biggest men in the industry. So just as he's been fighting Flair, I think, for like, what, 20 minutes? 
Flair is just out of it. And he's barely standing and Sean's tuning up the band for his super kick um, sweet chin music finisher. And he looks at him and he tells him, I'm sorry, I love you, and hits him with the finisher. I guess the one, two, three. Many would make fun of that. But to me, that is the ultimate form of expression between those two men. In the end, I am going to end your career because you want me to. But I'm sorry that it has to be me. And I love you. That's a very deep moment. Men have those moments in so many different ways. But because they're not done in the theater of what women would like, it just goes un- unnoticed, uncared for. And that's a problem. That's a problem. You know, at some point, you know, I, I, I get really excited that we live in a world now where men can be a bit more expressive. It's amazing. You know, my brother is so lucky because he has to live in a world where men openly express themselves without feeling any type of judgment, but there is still some judgment out there. And when it does appear, I think it has to be on us to stomp that judgment down. And it'd be like, hey, listen, keep that shit to yourself. The rest of us are enjoying something a bit more. You know, I, I've seen more fathers active in their kids' lives than ever before. That doesn't get talked about. I've seen more men being faithful in their relationships. That's not being talked about. You know, I've seen more men not only do what was expected of them before, but overcome those things and be even better than what was asked. You know, being the man of the house, not necessarily in a patriarchal sense, but just if all everything falls down, it's on my shoulders and I can manage it. I see a lot of men do that. Not talked about. You know, it it can't be men are always shit forever. It can't. It's unfair. You know. And it also has to go, it also has to be equal. It's like, if I take you out on a date, you should pay half. Especially if it's a first date. It's different when you're in a long-term relationship. Me and my girlfriend have a give and go, but... If you're out there hooking up with people now and the other person isn't picking up their part of the bill, that's some fucked up shit. Unless you explicitly say, I'm taking you out. That's a different story. But if it's not explicitly said, it should be on a slip of 50-50 balance. You want to be treated equally, that's equal. Hold your own doors. I'm kidding. But still, hold your own damn doors. You got your own basketball league? Get it together. (laughs) I'm kidding. Kidding, ladies. I know you've been through a lot. I sympathize. I empathize. But men were going through it too. Now, especially more than ever. Because the rules have changed now. And especially in an economy that isn't kind to anybody, men have been taking it kind of hard. Because normally we would be the one providing and it looks like it's going to be a little difficult to do that in this economy. But hey, when World War III comes, there'll be enough of us to die. So no one will have to worry about anything else. So. That got dark really quickly. But hey, World War III, I'm excited. Some of you might be. I am. I'm excited in a sense of... I never thought I'd live through a world war. I always wondered, would I be able to be given that chance? Not to go to war, though. I'm not going to go fight. I have no intention of going to fight. I will broadcast about it. That's my job. But I always wondered, if, if there was such an evil still in the world that needed to be dealt with, would the world come together and do something about it? And it looks like we might not have any other choice to. They want to do a slow 
annihilation of Ukraine, which sucks. Ukraine, I'm hoping, wins because they had some bomb-ass people over there handling some fucking business. But Sun tells me he's not going to stop with Ukraine. There's other places like Moldova. Crimea. He wants the old Russian Empire back. Here's a man who clearly had a dream. A dream of an empire. And he's clearly on his last legs. He looks like shit. He used to look good. I used to be angry that my presidents looked like shit. But he was like muscular and shit. That was a president I thought I could choke somebody out. And I want a president I could choke somebody out. Because I always have that like Olympus has fallen scenario in my head. Like which of my presidents do I think would pick up the gat and fight back? I haven't seen one yet. Still disappointed. The spryest person we had was Obama, but I don't even think he's fighting back like that. Sutton tells me Michelle does the fighting in that um, tandem. And the thing is, if you've ever seen her arms, she's got muscle and a good reach. Yeah, I think in an Olympus Fallen scenario, she would have handled herself pretty well. They wouldn't have taken her captive. I think she, like, it would have been like a Watchmen scenario. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. I think Michelle Obama would go hardcore. That's what I like about Michelle. I can put my trust in her. But every good bad man needs a cat woman, you know? Someone that's by their side. Who can, you know, bull whip somebody, pull them back, hit them with the claws. I think Zoe Kravitz is going to be a good cat woman. She's got... The sex appeal, the sultry voice. She's got the package. She's inherited it from beautiful parents. Can't do much more than that. But I think she's going to be great. She's an underrated actress in a lot of ways, I think. Like, even in Mad Max Fury Road, I thought for even for her little part, she did a very good job. She does a lot with a little, which is... A huge talent, I think. It goes off and unnoticed. But this is going to be good. Robert Pattinson, listen, I've been following his acting for like what? I didn't, I watched Twilight movies. I did. I watched all of them. Because I'm a firm believer if you hate something, you might as well watch, watch it to know it. So when the argument comes up, you're prepared. He was terrible in those movies, granted. But in other movies outside that, his independent work, fantastic. Amazing in The Lighthouse. I still don't understand The Lighthouse, I think. But he's amazing in it. And I think for this Batman, Batman's an easy role to play. I don't think it's that difficult to play, actually. I think people tack on whatever they want Batman to mean, and that's how they judge it. I look at it like James Bond. Like, as long as he's, you know, solving... As long as he's doing espionage and he's charming, it's fine. So as long as Batman's moody, he can fight, and he has like some sardonic humor, I'm good. And that's why I don't think there was ever a bad Batman, really. Let's run through them. Live action ones. Kevin Conroy, we could have a whole hour long discussion about why the Batman anime series is great. But let's just go live action. Michael Keaton, great 80s Batman, dressed really well unsuspecting you didn't think he could be Batman so in a way it made his Bruce Wayne more powerful I can never see Michael Keaton kicking somebody's ass that's Mr. Mom but he pulled it off and he had the crazy eyes which crazy eyes go a long way if you've been to a street fight when you see a guy has a certain kind of eyes you don't get into a street fight anymore you're walking away as someone who has fought in the street a few times you know when to walk away the intense eyes that bug out at you like this. You want the nuts? Let's get nuts. You know, shit like that. I've seen people do that. And you don't want to fuck around with those people. Michael Keaton, good job. Considering the Tim Burton Batman, a lot of it's, well, for the time, was considered dark and gritty. Now it's fucking goofy as shit. It worked. It worked. And having to play opposite Jack Nicholson's Joker made it even easier for him. 
he had to be the sane person in the room. Because Jack Nicholson was chewing scenery left and right. Still a great performance, though. Still a great performance. Probably one of the coolest um, applications of makeup I've ever seen. Like, yeah, that smile in hindsight looks cheesy, but I love it. I, I like that level of deformity in makeup. I remember as a kid being so, like, entranced by it. Like, how did they do that? Like, how many hours did he sit in makeup to get that done? And then I was even more fucking bugged out, like, when he had his normal skin applied to it. And then when they put, poured water on him, the white appeared under it. It was, it's little things like that that get me every time. And Keaton had two shots at it. Batman Returns, however you feel about it. It's solid. Danny DeVito is, uh, those movies had a lot of sexual overtones. And it just made me it just makes me feel like Tim Burton's just a really horny dude. Cause even in Edward Scissorhands, there's that whole um part where Johnny Depp hangs out with the Ambrosia salad lady and like she's opening up a, a salon for him. She takes him to the back and she starts doing his like weird strip tease for him. It's like I'm afraid to know what Tim Burton's sex life is like. It's probably bizarre. He probably puts like a weird mask on and stuff like that. Wears weird outfits. He does cast his wife in a lot of stuff too. So maybe that's part of the cosplay. You know, he casts her in movies so he can cosplay it at home. Just seems really gross. But Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. Eh. I was always hit half and half on it. It didn't work for me as a Catwoman, but it worked for me as a crazy lady. You know, but that became like an LGBTQ icon, though. So I got to give a shout out for that. Like, there's so many um, people in the LGBTQ community who tell me that character is iconic to them. And I'm like, well, fuck, yeah, it's cool. It could be all the leather and the um, whip stuff. So maybe there's something to do with that. Danny DeVito is just the perv for boobs in those movies. So I don't know. I mean, you look at the first movie. You got Kim Basinger, hottie. So he, so Keen had a lot to work with, you know. But he, I think he also played the best Batman for that time. Someone who could be cool, have a one liner that's kind of corny, but you respect it. It's admirable. The fighting, mm, what can you do? Then it was Val Kilmer, who I think was the beginning. Of dudes taking that role too seriously. Val really fell in love with the duality of it in Batman Forever. And you can tell he went full fucking apocalypse now. Like he went into his mind going, I have to really dig deep into what this character is. And to be honest, it didn't really need all that much. Because you got Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey ruining the rest of the fucking movie. Tommy Lee Jones had no idea who Two-Face is and only did it because his kids told him to. And hated his entire experience because Jim Carrey was there, which I don't blame him. I, too, despise Jim Carrey. I find him to be over the top and really fucking annoying. And he ruined one of my favorite characters, the Riddler, which hype for Paul Dano tonight. But in essence, Val Kilmer had to do that because look what's on the other side. A bunch of goofy ass motherfuckers. Then you had um, this chick. Damn it. What's her name? Chase Meridian, that's her character name, but what's the real name? She was married to Tom Cruise. I don't want to have to look it up. No, Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman, firecracker in that movie. Whew. Could have set the whole thing on fire. And oddly enough, Drew Barrymore and Debbie Mazar is in that movie too. But, you know, interesting concept for a film, you know, taking over people's minds, using it to get their secrets. I kind of like the idea. Val Kilmer, I think he was... He was okay for if, if you want someone to really tackle the duality of Batman, just like the emotional stuntedness of a kid still stuck in that time and a man who hasn't processed his grief. I think he still works at that. Is it a little corny? A tad. But I think it still works for the movie he's in. Now we get to George Clooney, which everyone shits on, but I don't think he's all that bad. I think he's a great Bruce Wayne, just not a great Batman. 
And I think it's a fair assessment. He gets all the humor down of Bruce. He has the playboy aspect of it, but he never really is able to hit on to that vengeful spirit that lives in him. And that's also because of the movie he's in. He's got a guy with a fucking freezing gun. He's got this chick who talks to fucking plants. In theory, they're the heroes because one's trying to stop global warming. The other one's trying to bring back plants. And he's the billionaire asshole. So it's not fair. It's also Joe Schumacher being his most corny possible. But the Alfred storyline and his scene with Alfred when he thinks he's going to die is really good. George Clooney's not terrible in that movie. It's a terrible movie around George Clooney. And Chris O'Donnell doesn't help nothing. Then again, ask his NCIS co-workers. They'll probably say the same. And Alicia Silverstone, listen, hottie, probably not the best bad girl though. Coolio's in that movie. But I think George, it sucks. I wish George would have had one more bite at the apple with a better movie. I think he really could have done it really well. I like the fact that he was a bit gray in that movie that's an older Batman. You know, I thought that was an interesting take on it. But no, that movie just failed him. Then you wait a while and you get the Dark Knight trilogy. To me, the grounded approach of Nolan, it feels like Batman's a super cop. Like, he's just a cop that has, like, really cool outfits. Like, he doesn't really solve crimes, per se. He just shows up to them and just collects evidence and pretends to solve them. He has, like, one detective thing in Dark Knight, which is the whole bullet um, ballistics thing, but it's never really explained what that's meant to accomplish. In the fact that he didn't see that Talia al Ghul thing coming in Dark Knight Rises makes him even a worse Batman for it. But I wouldn't say he's the worst Batman. I would say he's been the second best so far. I think he gets down the, the torture aspect of Bruce. I think he deals with all the emotional trauma, the addiction to justice that Batman has, which I wish Dark Knight Rises had done more with. Dark Knight Rises fails for a number of reasons, but it fails because it betrays the first two movies. Like, Batman wouldn't quit, even if it was for Rachel. In theory, if he is addicted to justice, he actually would have gone more deep into um, fighting crime for Rachel, using Rachel as an excuse to go harder and faster. So when Alfred tells him, oh, you're looking to die, it would make sense, as opposed to him, Alfred saying to a guy who's been quitting for eight years and only came out because Bane's kind of a fucking badass. I don't write the movies. I just watch them. But I think Bale did the best he could with Dark Knight Rises. But Batman Begins still is probably my favorite Batman movie. It gets Batman right. It's just enough fantastical, just enough realistic to just hit it all together. And the look of that movie is really beautiful. I love the use of browns. Browns and reds in movies always get me. You use those colors right, you got me. The movie could suck dick, and I'll be like, but they use the browns and reds so good. Dark Knight, it, it's a masterpiece, but, 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 I think it's unwatchable in most cases. I fall asleep every time I watch it. That Hong Kong sequence has to go. Like, you cut that out the movie, the movie's way more rewatchable. It doesn't go anywhere, really. Yeah, it goes on later to when he's in the, he's in there with the Joker and Joker's kind of acts to be arrested so he can get closer to him and bring him back to the mob bosses and light him on fire with the pile of money. But I could have gone without it. I think you could have done a bunch of other things there, but also that movie is really predicated on two face. Cause he makes the big jump. Aaron Eckhart, he's the real character development in that movie. He has an actual change. Bruce, not so much. And maybe that's on purpose. I don't know. I'm not an artist. I'm just a dude who watches movies. But I do think Bill just, he was good. I think he got the physicality right. I did like his physique. He did sell me on the physique. No other Batman has sold me on a physique um, before that until him. And that's a huge thing for me. Like, I want to believe you can beat somebody's ass. And he could. He could. Then we arrive to Ben Affleck, who, I'm sorry, I love Ben Affleck. I love him. 
He's my hero. He's my guy. Yes. He said some very mean things about his ex-wife recently, but you know, he was hurt and hurt people hurt people. You know what I mean? He's got a heel, bro. He's in a heel. He's healing right now with JLo, who I think is a little beneath him because he is a god and she is whatever. But what can you do, you know? But I think Ben got the sardonic humor right. Like, him and Kevin Conroy both have this ability to tell jokes with Batman that no one else is able to do. Like, Kevin Conroy can make Batman have humor while um, Ben Affleck um, does it the same way, but one is a bit more... Kevin Conroy is a bit more lighter because he is on the animated TV show, so it has to be a bit more lighter and a bit more cheesy, but it's a wink and a nod, where where Bruce is always a roast. Everything he says to you is a roast. Like, it's shade. It's just, I'm hitting you because I can. And this is how I play. You know? I hear you could talk to Fish. You know what I mean? When he tells Bruce about the whole, you know, every time, you know, you've got... Or he tells he tells Clark about the Superman line from um, Batman vs. Superman. Like, every time your guy saves a cat out of a tree, saves a cat out of a tree... You write a puff piece article about him, you know, and he says, you know, maybe it's my been maybe it's my time in Gotham, but I just don't like dealing with clowns. I'm paraphrasing, but like it, he does that very well. Like he's able to, you know, hit a level of humor that you don't expect. Like even the Josh Whedon cut of Justice League, like as bad as Batman's humor was in that, Ben made it believable a little bit. Like he made the best of it. But I think what Ben gets is the determination of Batman that's in Frank Miller's, that's in Jeff Loeb's, that's in, um, I mean, yeah, I think those are the two you would really go to. Even in Grant Morrison's, there's a level of drive in Batman that a lot of people, Bale got to a degree, but Ben really honed in on. And just even with the writing of um, Batman vs. Superman where... He says, you know, even if there's a 1% possibility, we have to take it as 100% certainty. That is how Batman operates. And he, the way he delivers that line, the way he approaches Superman that entire movie is fucking full-on Bruce. But we can argue about the Martha thing all we want. Is it a corny moment? Completely a corny moment in which he finds out that Superman's mom is also Martha. And he goes, why would you say that name? Like, yes, it's, it's not great. But it worked on me. I was already bought into the movie anyway. But I think Ben, for me, has been the best Batman. Because he's to me, he's done both. He's convinced me he is a spirit of vengeance. But he has also convinced me he's a guy trying to get it right. And a guy who really gives a shit about cleaning up the streets. And being the best he can be. You know, even in the, the, the um, Snyder cut of Justice League, they really do such a huge service for Ben. Because you really get to see where it all comes from and all that work Ben did. The, like, that whole training sequence in Mary Sue, he's like, he's like going hard and pulling the big tire. Like, that's how I imagine a guy of that level of ambition and addiction operates. He has to be the strongest motherfucker on the planet. And he arguably has the best Batman fight scene or the most true to comics Batman fight scene out of all the Batman. That warehouse sequence, it's perfect. It's what Batman does. He wouldn't stab anyone with a batarang. Are you fucking kidding me? He puts batarangs through people's hands all the fucking time. What are we talking about? Batman doesn't kill. Are you fucking serious? He's blown up shit left and right and left people to die how many times? This is what he does. He finds a convenient way of it not being murder, but it's still murder. All comic book heroes do it. Deal with it. What I'm excited for for Robert Pattinson is, I think Batman's never been portrayed as someone as small as Robert Pattinson is before, which is fine because if you look at most successful MMA fighters and boxing um, fighters or boxers, <laughs> boxers, there's a name for it, Ralph. They're all lightweight, they're fast, they, they operate very differently. And I do think it's time for a slimmer Batman. Someone who's a bit more of the time. And I think what Robert Pattinson does with his eyes is really good. I think he's going to 
really get into the inner turmoil. The way um, Ryan Gosling does with his character in Drive, the way he does it with um, Only God Forgives, and um, there's another movie that's escaping me, but what they're able to do with no words is more powerful than what a lot of guys can do with words. So I was always interested in Pattinson. I don't know if I was always 100% signed on. Ben Affleck, I wasn't necessarily 100% signed off on, signed on for originally. And I turned out to be happily wrong. But I think I will be bought into Robert Pattinson. The, the trailers get me. He has more of a, like that. the hair is a little interesting. Um, it's more of my chemical romancy. But there's something in those eyes that makes me fucking believe. And it's how I always felt about Philip Seymour Hoffman. If you looked at Philip Seymour Hoffman's eyes, you knew he believed, especially in The Master. I think that's probably Paul Thomas Anderson's best movie. A lot of people disagree. A lot of people go with um, Phantom Thread. A lot of people really fucking suck Inherent Vice's dick, and I don't get it. I didn't like Inherent Vice at all. It just felt like someone's idea of what drugs would be, which I find to be weird. I know Paul Thomas Anderson has done drugs, so it's like bizarre. But I think Robert Pattinson is going to be great. I think this movie is going to be good. I'm a little annoyed because it's kind of the dream Batman movie I always wanted to do. If you know me personally, I've always pitched my seven with, you know, once again, even with a black Gordon, that Gordon would have been Morgan Freeman and Batman's kind of um, Brad Pitt and the Riddler's, you know, John Doe. That's the movie I always wanted to make. And I always did want um, Penguin in there as an arms dealer. My, my, my version would have been, it would have been called Sons of Gotham, and it would have been about like three people whose entire lives are dictated by being born in Gotham. So there's a Riddler who I would have made Latino, and who would have been much more of a Occupy Wall Street kind of like dude. Like his crimes are social justice, you know. And the Penguin is someone who grew up with Bruce, both of their parents killed by gun violence, but. Um, the Penguin uses his firearms company to enforce or to do some form of gun control where like only your, your handprint um, can activate the gun or it's only registered for cops. So he's like trying to like run his family business, but also turn it into something better. And him and Bruce are coming together to kind of clean guns off the street and find out if there must be guns, what can we do to make this the cleanest business possible? But through the, the movie, you found that he's full of shit. You know, that would have been my version. And then it would have ended with, you know, Riddler, you know, getting Penguin, kind of kidnapping him, making Bruce pick and stuff like that. We would have put into this whole, like, thing of, do you pick Gotham or do you pick the Penguin? Of course, Batman saves both because he's able to do that. But what I would have done was I would have had him mention in his big speech, you know, the people who really run this city, the people, this Illuminati-like group, you know, that you hear about, that they're the real power in Gotham, and they're the rich elites, yada, yada, yada. So with the Riddler getting caught, my ending scene would have been him in jail and an owl flying to the window, looking over him, and he smiles because he realizes that's the elites, the court of owls from the comic books. That would have been, like, my tag. But I'm, I'm hyped for other... Batman villains. I would love to see Mad Hatter. Like, I, I have an idea for a Mad Hatter movie. You know, it'd be like Ready or Not, but with Batgirl, and she's caught in the Mad Hatter's mansion, and she's got to fight the Wonderland gang. She's got to get out of there. You know, Mad Hatter, I think, works. Clayface, I think, works. And you know, I think it's, I think you can find a scientific way of doing that. KG Beast, I don't know. Mr. Scarface would be kind of cool, you know, puppetry angle, but I think there's so many things you can do. You know, Scarecrow, you already did it. I think Cillian Murphy did such a great job. I don't ever want to see anyone touch it again. But someone will. I think Bane was fine. Um, For Dark Knight Rises, I'm trying to think who would be someone we haven't seen yet. Listen, I'm, I I go Clock King all the time. I love the Clock King episodes of um that many anime series. You know, Killer Croc, I think that could be interesting. Solomon Grundy could be interesting. You know, there's so many guys you still have left to play with. And Mr. Freeze, you know, I would love to see him take another crack at that. You know, find a way to make that work. Poison Ivy, I still think, is an amazing villain. You know, 
I think that's someone who that's a, what's beautiful about that character is not only is the character itself beautiful physically, but the power she has is extremely beautiful. But she's deduced that humans are the problem, and I gotta get rid of all of them. It's a beautiful way to look at it. And I think that would be a cool, just visually speaking, just doors busting down and vines coming through hallways. It's so cool. I think that'd be so dope. But who knows? We're probably going to get 14 million more Batman reboots by the time I'm dead. So I'll probably see all these villains at some point. But I am excited for the Batman. I am excited to really dig into it. I love Matt Reeves' work. Matt Reeves has made the Planet of the Apes films recently and also made Cloverfield. So and I fucks with Cloverfield hard. And he's someone who I think can take the absurd, like, Planet of the Apes and find a real emotional anchor for it. If you haven't watched the last two Planet of the Apes movies, you should. It's an amazing trilogy. He makes you believe. It makes you feel for those CGI monkeys. And it's not it's not just Andy Serkis doing amazing mocap work. The way Matt Reeves scripts his stories is there's an emotional base, and he has to sell you on that first unless you're going to buy everything else. Not a lot of guys do that. But I'm excited. Because it's time to go back outside. I live in Gotham, so why not go see a movie about Gotham and hope it all goes well? Well, kids, that's our time this week. Next week, who knows what will happen? Maybe the bomb will drop. Maybe the nuke will finally drop and we'll all be gone. But at least we'll have all seen Batman before then. But who knows? I'm not entirely sure how this is going to end. 